Hello, Salt Strong Nation, Joe Simons, like diamonds, got my brother Luke Simons, like diamonds, got a troll motor behind you, what the heck is going on there, dude? Got some electrical problems and have to figure it out later this afternoon, so Ooh. it's sitting here inside. Boat ownership, the thrills, never-ending fix my boat issues. They're well, worth every cent. Worth every I cent. Well, it's not if you're getting skunked every day, which is really the topic of this podcast, is how to pre-trip plan to help you catch more fish, to maximize your time. After all the guests we've had, I think this is getting close to episode 250, we've had a lot of really amazing guests on here. And I always ask, like, you know, what's something that you see a lot of weekend warriors not doing correctly? What are some mistakes and casting comes up always at the top. And the other one is just preacher planning. You know, that most anglers go out there with not, um, some not a plan at all, but many just like have just kind of one spot picked out. It's usually a spot they caught something before. And they don't pre-trip plan based on, on tides, based on the weather, the wind, right? Based on all the, the things that truly do matter. And uh, there's that quote that Abe Lincoln had. He said, if I had four hours to cut down a tree, I'd spend three hours sharpening the ax before he, you know, started cutting. And then that's so true of fishing. Tony, who is kind of one of the first people to really go through Tony Acevedo to go through our insider club and, and really like just shine and get it. He lived in Orlando. And so, you know, it was painful to have to drive all the way to Orlando and then back, which is like an hour and a half in traffic. If you didn't catch fish from Titusville. And I mean, so guess what he did? He's like, I'm going to spend a ton of time, like hours pre-trip planning. And now he's shortened down that time as he kind of gets it. But in the beginning, he was literally spending hours before he went fishing to make sure that he was not going to get skunked. And, and it worked. That dude kills it. So um, we got Lukey on here. We're going to pull up some maps. Luke, you got a map? Yeah. And, and just first wanted to just to highlight the importance of this. Um, it's really, it's the old the old saying, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And, and that like is, that. that's true with pretty much everything and, and including fishing. And this isn't just for people with boats. That's another common, um, I guess, misconception that's out there. Um, a lot of our tips are, are either fishing from boat for me or, or uh, Wyatt and, uh, and Tony fishing from kayak. And so oh, I'm a wade fisherman, doesn't apply to me, or oh, I'm, I'm a boat fisherman, doesn't, you know, doesn't apply to me. Whatever the case is, whatever the excuse is, I should say, it applies to us all. The fish don't care how you get to them. They're going to be in the same spots regardless. And then if so, you apply these same tactics strategies, whether you're fishing from shore, fishing from a kayak, or fishing from the boat. Fish are going to be in the same spots regardless. And then it just comes to, uh, you just have to factor in, okay, how can you, can you get to them, first of all? And then if so, how? So um, the key thing, though, is, is you have to plan and so we'll go through the processes. And the, and the, gr the great news is that we set up a, a separate platform. This is, this is actually outside of our main website, which is saltstar.com. We set up a, a platform called Smart Fishing Tides. And, and the idea behind that was just to make it as easy as possible for fishermen to, to have all the tools they need to go out and, and effectively plan their trips. That's everything. So that's what we'll go to. Let me let me pull that that puppy up. So again, it's called Smart Fishing Tides. Yep, and, and we'll basically Luke's, go through the case study. Yeah, while Luke's pulling that up, we we do this every single week. What we're doing here for our insider members every Friday, we get on maps and do this a whole lot more in depth. So if if you if you do like this and you're not a member, know that that we're doing this every single week and. <laughs> Uh, for all 16,000 plus four members showing them where to go fishing based on all these trends, based on the, the forecast, uh, based on tides, based on wind direction. It's incredibly helpful. Uh, but this will be a really cool case study for one. We're, we're going to fish Venice. Is that the plan? Venice, Italy yeah, or Venice, check Florida? Out, uh, Venice, Florida. And, yeah. and so this, so right now we're looking at smart for those, for those listening, we're on smartfishingtides.com for those watching. We're on the, the website. And, and so you can see what it has. So it has the tides, crucial, right? So most fishermen plan with the tides and that's good. That's a start. Um, but most people stop there, right? They kind of like what I used to do is I would look at the tides and then I would look at the, at the radar to make sure there's no storms coming that I wasn't going to get, get stuck in a lightning storm. How'd that work I for rarely, you? I rarely, go ahead, Joe. How'd that work for you? 
Uh, not so good. Uh, again, I, I was planning to fail. I, I didn't have an effective plan, so I didn't have an effective, uh, I, did, I definitely did not have an effectively consistent results in my fish catching. And again, it, uh, most of it was due to, to not doing this properly. Um, so we need to know the tides, we need to know the weather. That's one thing that most people miss out on. And I'm not talking about, again, I'm not talking about looking for storms. I'm talking about knowing the wind speed, the wind direction, and then also how the wind has been changing, right? Was it windy one day, calm the next, or vice versa? Was the wind coming from one direction one day and did it switch? That's very important. That impacts the currents a lot, especially if there's high winds and a big shift. Really, really big deal. And then obviously the fishing forecast, we do have an algorithm that, that kind of gives, gives some generic, not generic, but, but gives some insight that is more of a high level. And then it's up to us to know the low level stuff. And again, the low level stuff is really what we, what we focus on for club members on a weekly basis, as Joe said. And obviously then we have the radar in motion for safety. And then we have some, uh, some sonar maps for those of us who, uh, who are targeting areas that don't have clear water. So um, what do you think, Joe? Let's go ahead and go through a case study. Yeah, let's, let's pick, pick that Venice area. Yeah, so you can either search in this little search by city or you can watch this kind of more fun just to zoom around. So I'll zoom down to Venice, Florida. And if you're listening, right. Luke's on a map on smartfishingtides.com and you can zoom in. It's a Google map that has these little heads on there. And that head means that we have a, uh, a tide station there that we can pull all the data that we need from and even give you a strike score on a, on a calendar. All right, so now we're at the tide station closest to the area that we're gonna fish. And, uh, and, and so what day are we, gonna, are we gonna do this for tomorrow, today, what's- yeah, Let's tomorrow? act like we're going tomorrow. I mean, it's an 8.7 and, and what, what you should be doing as an angler is doing this pre-trip planning the day before. Uh, so I think it would be helpful to, to, let's pretend it's afternoon, which it is right now, and we're going tomorrow on Wednesday the 16th. Yeah, and so, so tomorrow, here it is. So now we know that the new moon is tomorrow, right? The new moon's on Thursday, so that's automatic. I'm going fishing as long as the weather's not terrible in many cases. And we look down and the weather is not, it's not terrible, it's not great, but this actually is, a, this, this is the exact type of day that I like to see. Um, I don't quite like the wind from the south quite as much, but um, the fish will still be biting and we'll just have to change our, our uh, strategy a little bit. But um, here's the tide chart. So we, at this one view, the reason why I really like this and why now this is all I use for pre-trip planning is because it has everything in one screen. You can see the tide chart. You can see an overlay of the hourly weather forecast, including the wind speed and wind direction, as well as you know, precipitation, whether it's going to be sunny or cloudy or rainy. Um, so uh, amazingly helpful. I used to have to go from one thing to another to another to get all that, and now it's all in one spot. So this is like the, the most valuable part of this platform, in my opinion, other than the feeding projections that we'll get to later. But super super helpful and so just by looking at this right we're on tomorrow um and and, just, and by knowing the latest trends or the latest feeding trends is again another thing that we really focus on for club members every week every friday we give the latest and greatest trends so lately the the best bite has been in the twilight periods so early morning right before an hour or two before and after the sun rises and then the same for the evening so just that alone has been a really good trigger. And if we have to choose between the two, I'm gonna choose the one that has the best tides, the best current flow during that period. So we can see the evening is at the bottom of the tide, pretty much gonna be slack current period. Whereas the morning, we've got a nice slope of the line, right? Slope of the line is how you derive current. This is the water height at any given time. And the more, the, I guess the faster the water height is going up or going down, the steeper the slope, and that means the more current flow, right? Water's moving up or down, it has to go somewhere and it has to go faster than the other period. So this would be the ideal. Just look at this chart, again, should take us, it, it, once you get used to this, it'll take you about 10 seconds and you look at this map, you look at this one page and know exactly when you should fish. And then you, you can see the, what's, what direction the wind's going, you know what direction the current's going, and that just that alone, you can apply it to a map and you can, you can have surprisingly good results. And, so and since we, we know we have, looks like rain kind of all day in and out, maybe some scattered showers, you also look at the wind, right? 
look at it starts off at 10 miles an hour. You can see as the day progresses, it gets up to 15 later in the, in the day, and it shifts from that east southeast to, to south. So talk about that as well, because that that is something that I didn't understand for the longest time. I was like you. I'd like, hey, I go look at tide chart and then uh and then hey make sure there's no lightning storms coming talk talk about the the wind direction and why that would impact decisions as well right now yeah so the wind speed gradually getting up that's normal right it's usually calmer in the morning than in the afternoon um, sometimes it's not the case but that's normal but the, the shift is a big deal um i i don't care so much that it's it's moving actually in this case it goes southeast to south so it's that's a pretty big shift i don't care so much if it goes from um, like southeast to south, southeast, right? But even southeast to south isn't that big of a deal. Where I really, um, where I really take notice is, is if it's going, if it's going from really calm to really fast, like a zero to twenty or zero to fifteen. In this case, it's relatively the same. Or if it takes like a one hundred and eighty degree, or at least close, at least more than forty-five degree turn. In this case, it's going to be southeast to south. Um, kind of be mindful of that, but. Um, and the reason why is that if if the wind shifts from one direction to another, especially if it's if it's over 10 miles an hour, that's going to be pushing water, and so that's going to be pushing that's going to be impacting the current flow. Um, just to give you an example, let's go to the map. Uh, all right, so we're in this we're in this bay, in this bay. Let's just look at this big this big bay right here. So we have I can't remember the name of this bay, but it's in Sarasota. So we have this big body of water. There's no there's no inlet other than the one down here. And so if we have a, a wind from the north, that's 10 miles an hour, we'll just pick a number, just the friction of the wind on that water is pushing that water down. And it's, it's, that's actually impacting the current. Um, but if we have a, a quick switch, right, if it, if it now turns within a day, if it turns from the south at 10, that's gonna be moving all this water up onto the other side. And that's gonna be just pushing water out. So just be very, very mindful of that. That'll actually impact the depth relative to the normal tide on one side of the bay to the other. The wind is a much bigger factor than I ever thought it was. So super important to, to, to take note of. Obviously every, every waterway is different, but, uh, but that's the, the general plan. And if it goes from like an onshore wind, let's say it's coming from the, uh, come from the west, we're over here on the Gulf Coast, that's pushing a lot of water up into the bays, right? Because all that wind, every, every square inch of water surface that of, of the Gulf, that wind is pushing that that water inland. And then if it goes from 10 miles an hour inland and then switches out, now all this water that was pushed inland is now being pushed out. So the outgoing currents are gonna be way stronger than normal and the incoming currents are gonna be weaker than normal. So that's why I'm saying it's really important to know that. So the, the more you pay attention to the, to the wind directions and, and wind speeds, the, uh, the more accurately you're going to be able to, uh, to predict when the best feeding times are. So and then five years, I totally overlooked this. Yeah. And then finally, it, it should instantly give you an idea of what types of areas that you want to fish, right? Um, you know, for instance, if, if you know it's, um, let's just say it's, it's still considered summertime right now, um, even though it kind of feels like it should be getting to fall, it's looking at a calendar, but it still feels like summer outside here in Florida you know that in the in the mornings you are going to be looking for maybe some some areas that that uh that that have a little bit more of a of, of obviously if you have 15 20 mile an hour winds you don't want them hitting that shoreline uh because it just gets really tough to fish but you still want a little bit of that oxygenated water so i've seen you do it say all right the wind's coming at this direction like we want to be fishing on this side of any type of island or mangrove or oyster bar or whatever and you're even picking your spots based on the wind direction 100 percent, yeah and, and and if you're not you're missing a big part of the equation it, it's not it's not the case throughout all seasons but in, in in many of the seasons the wind direction is a huge deal and it 100 percent needs to be part of your plan if that's left out of the plan that is a, that is a significant oversight again i know from experience because i did it for many years um so i and i've seen i've, I've experienced the change that it makes once you once you're able to put it all together, huge huge difference. Um, so let's just let's just say we're going to fish tomorrow. And so lately, again, we we give updates on this every week, every Friday. Lately, the trend has been that the 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 wind the wind blown shorelines and the current um, the current exposed shorelines, ideally both, have had good bites. 
And so what I, what I just, again, just from looking at knowing that information, right? And now looking at this tide chart, which shows that the, um, the tides plus the wind by hour, I automatically know which way the current's going and I know the wind's coming from the Southeast. So the current's coming in, the wind's coming from the Southeast and now we can just easily go to that map and, and check this out. And also other feeding trend that we've been, um, that we've been forecasting and, and, uh, and showing is that a lot of the feeding activity has been happening in and around the passes and inlets. So it's just those few data points um, I can quickly narrow down the spots that are most likely going to have fish. And so, again, we know that the wind's coming from the southeast, right? Southeast wind, the current is coming in. And so we, with that information, we can kind of use that. So ideally, we want to find some spots that have current exposure and wind exposure, or at least, at least one of the two, ideally both, but at least one of the two. So some parts that come to mind, is again, wind coming from the southeast, all this is kind of small, so the, there's not gonna be a ton of wind hitting, but I would like to hit spots like this point right here, right? Because we have this current sneaking in. And if for those listening, we're basically following the current flow from the Gulf inland, and we're looking at all the different spots where it has wind and current exposure. So this point, current hitting it this way, wind hitting it this way, that's a really, really good setup because now you can come in with the wind. Now, we, know we, can, we can automatically know our approach, right? We know what direction the wind and the current is going, so we automatically know, okay, if we're in a boat or a kayak, I'm going to start upwind so I can cast with the wind to maximize casting distance and then retrieve the lure with the current to be pulling the lure in the proper direction. All right, say so that again. That's, that's so critical uh, about the positioning uh, that so many people mess up. So you're, you're, for those of you listening, he's, uh, he's, he's in a, it's a point and it uh, looks like kind of residential, some canals and stuff that's really, really close to the only uh, pass slash inlet that is, uh, that is in this area of Sarasota slash Venice. Uh, and this is, this is not Venice though, right? This is Sarasota? No, it's Earth's Venice. Sarasota's a little bit north of there. Okay. Either way, it doesn't matter. This it doesn't matter where you are. The same tech. You could be over in Texas, anywhere. The same technique applies, yep. right? I, I, I digress. Um, talking about redfish, snook, trout, flounder, they all behave the exact same way. Yep. So we got incoming tide. So it's coming and hitting that point, and then you have the wind coming from the southeast. So it's coming upwards. Talk. Say that. Say that again about how you would fish that area, because this is what is left out, I believe, of so many conversations. Yeah. So and, and again, I'll just go back to what I did. For many years before, I say, okay, I've heard about, I've heard this spot is good. I get a spot tip from somebody, without without the talking about the the conditions, right? Spots without without specific conditions are are a waste and it, it means nothing. And so what I used to do is I'd just go to the spot and okay, I'll just go there and I'd come in the whatever way was most most the easiest. But the proper thing to do is to, whenever possible, approach a spot with the wind at your back so that you can cast with the wind, right? You're maximizing the casting distance. And if it is windy, when it gets over 10 miles an hour is not too big of a deal. When it gets more than that, it becomes, it's really tough to effectively retrieve a lure if, you, if you're casting into the wind or especially crosswind. So casting with the wind is the ideal situation. You can get the casting distance uh, from the wind's help. And then on your retrieve, the, the wind isn't bowing your line one way or the other. Because once it starts bowing your line, uh, you really can't feel much, and you, you just lose control. So, um, so again, automatically we know it should. Do, after practice, this, all this takes like literally a minute or less. So you're going to know, okay, I'm going to go to this. I'm fish the spot. Automatically know you're going to approach from the upward wind position. You're going to be casting up wind, or sorry, casting with the wind, and then retrieving your lure with the current. Both are the ideal situations. So just doing that alone, this would be a good spot, right? And a similar case would be right here. You still get some current exposure from this, this point and the wind is hitting as well. The wind will basically be going down the shoreline. Again, you're casting with the wind, you're retrieving with the current. There's more than likely gonna be some snook and probably some reds and trout on both these spots. And another, uh, another point would be right here, right? Similar situation, this one, you're getting a lot of current exposure because it's getting smacked you know, get the currents going in this, in this, uh, inside the pass and it's coming up through here you, that these houses are blocking some of the wind, but you're still going to get some wind wrapping around. This wind is going to be funneling through this cut 
and there's going to be a good amount of wind still coming through here. And, uh, and coincidentally, I fished this just to show how effective this is, is actually um, I had a, on my trolling motor was uh, having issues a, a few months ago. I uh, took it down to a, a place down at Placida that I go to and I had a, a little bit of time when I was picking it up. So I, I, put, I packed the paddle board. I've never fished Venice before ever. I never talked to anybody about where to fish or any, got any tips. And I just found this park right here. And so I literally just, like, you know, I, I didn't know what it looked like. So I grabbed this little fella and then we can go check out. It's really cool. You can even put the, the person on these maps and see what the, what the launches look like. In this case, I was launching my paddleboard. So without ever being there, I could see that this is a nice launch, right? There's a ton of just open I wonder, area. I wonder if you can launch a kayak there. Oh, whammy. You can. <laughs> Imagine that. If you guys are listening, there's like seven kayaks all being launched right here. Yeah, this is like the little street view. And this is new where, where it, you can usually, in the past, it was all roads. And now you can literally see, you lit, it has like points on, on all sorts of areas. It's, it's crazy, cool. right? Like now, now like even on a, what would it was piers and Sebastian Inlet, like that jetty, like you could, you could literally like walk down the beach. Yeah, and right there. here. Check, check this out. You want oh, to see what go. the jetty yep. looks like. You can, look at these guys waving to it. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So you can literally walk, you can basically go up and down this area without ever having to step, have to leave your house. Pretty powerful. You could even see when someone might be, you know, reeling in a big fish. And uh... <laughs> Yeah, so, so anyhow, so what I did is I launched here, right? I, I just did this quick research. I launched here, we had an incoming current and I went over across this point and, I, and the very first cast, I hooked a snook. So that's like, just how powerful it is. Like you can go to an area that you've never been before armed with just a little bit of intel and, and just knowledge on how to how to use these maps and how to apply the trends to what different areas and you can you can automatically catch fish as if you live there forever the, the the amount of information available with these maps as long as you know how to use them and as long as you know what the trends are and how to apply them you can literally catch fish anywhere it is it is really it has really been eye-opening to see how effective this is that's why i can't stress enough the importance Yep. And, and the importance of having a plan, right? It, um, as we all know, I, I know, I know it's intimidating, like, cause you look at these maps and it looks so simple and all of a sudden you actually get there and it's like, oh my gosh, looks, looks so different. And all of a sudden people like throw any plan they had just out the window and now they're just guessing next thing you know, you're getting frustrated. Next thing you know, you're not catching fish. Next thing you know, you're catching catfish. Next thing you know, you're going to Marina buying shrimp because you know, you you've lost, all ability to even think straight. And so I, I think it's so critical to have a, a plan and, and then to stick with it. That doesn't mean you got to stick with the first spot you pick. That would be asinine if you're not catching fish, but to have a plan, what do you pick normally five spots, like five, five kind of areas that you're going to try and you start with one and you keep moving down based on all of the trends and based on the wind and, and the conditions. Is that five, yeah, yeah, five just, your magic yeah. number kind of? I was about to say that, yeah, I would say five plus or minus and uh, five is the normal number. I, I usually just fish for like three hours when I, when I travel around um, and that's, that should be plenty of time to go out and catch and literally catch a slam, catch some fish, even in areas you've never been to before. And I usually pick five spots and no matter how much you do this, it's never gonna be perfect, right? Map reading is just map reading. It's just, it's just putting the odds in your favor is what it's doing. It's not a hundred percent, right? So it's impossible to, you don't pick one spot because no matter how good it looks on the map, it could have the perfect situation. And there could have been a dolphin that just came through. There could be somebody already fishing it or the fish just could not be there. Something happened. The fish just weren't where they were supposed to be. That's normal. Fish are fish. They're not 100% predictable, but they're way more predictable than I ever thought they were uh, once learning, you know, their behavior patterns. But regardless, I picked five spots and it's, Although that you know that's not going to be a hundred percent, it is extremely rare where at least some fish aren't caught in the first two to three spots. Right, like usually one spot might be bust, um, but it's rare that three are, and it's almost impossible that five are. And in general, if you get to a spot, and it's no matter how good it looks on the map, if you're not seeing any signs of life, if you're not seeing you know, bait, bait fish activity, if you're not seeing feeding birds or if you're, if you're not getting strikes or even seeing fish, pick up and leave like in 15 minutes. I, uh, if I get a spot and, and even no matter how good it looks, 
I'm, I'm bailing in 15 minutes if I don't see anything good. I'm off next because I know as long as I go to my five spots, I know that my plan was based on good data and my, my plan was well-founded. And so I know that statistically, as long as I just go to those spots and focus my time on the ones that look the best, right, that have the most food and the most, just the most activity, I'm, I'm going to catch the, the most fish most consistently. So um, huge, huge uh, value to being, uh, being diligent on just keeping uh, your eyes out, look for activity and look for the presence of no activity, right? Just take note of that. And if you're not seeing anything, get up and go. It's, uh, it's not worth wasting time. No matter if there's not fish there, you, you, no matter how many lure changes you have, um, no matter how long you sit there, you're not going to catch any. Yeah, I'm, I'm going through your Redfish Secrets book right now. Um, I don't know if it'll be out by time people hear this or not, but um, that's a book Luke has been working on for a couple of years now of every one of his best Redfish Secrets, including, you know, a lot of the tips and tricks and shortcuts we've learned from some of our coaches like the Peter Deeks and C. Richardson, et cetera. It's, uh, it's amazing. But I, I, I wrote, jotted down some notes that when you're looking at a new spot, so this is, this is more of the now on the water kind of pre-trip planning. And when you're assessing a new spot, Luke's like, it's really comes down to these three things. You got current, which we've been talking about here. We've got structure, which we've also kind of talked about a little bit. And then the three B's, which Luke just kind of touched on. So current, number one, structure, number two, and then we look for those three B's, which is the birds, the, the bait, and the boils like if you got those five things if you have those combined you're in an area most likely where there are some fish and you might not be in the exact right spot you might you know you might have to move around a little bit or let the wind push a little bit but if you have those three things working in your favor you, the chances of you catching fish skyrocket and, and and just the opposite if you don't have any current and you don't see any birds or bait it's like you know and, and there's hardly any structure or even if there is just structure but you're missing the rest your chances go down big time uh so it's so critical to critical to focus on all of those things if you don't mind luke what are a couple other spots that that you kind of like around here based on on this exact day assuming you and i are going to go fish this tomorrow uh, and then maybe I think what would be fun is maybe even pick a couple areas that you would not fish and, uh, and, and say why, if that's possible. All right. So, uh, so other areas that I would fish and, and it would, again, I would go to the same premise. Um, I would like to, I would like the wind blown, uh, but, but so I would, I would choose these couple points right here, right? This the, and this one in particular looks great. You have this oyster bar sitting there. That looks awesome. Um, so the current's going to be coming through. It's going to be hitting by wind. Um, where, and, and when I go up there, I would obviously look if there's a bunch of birds. So I'm not saying never fish the, the wind protected shoreline if, when the windy side is trending, but just don't plan on it unless, unless you see something that catches your eye. So statistically, again, based on the latest trends that's been happening lately, if you're watching this down the road, this, this may very well not apply, <laughs> but the windy side is where it's happening. It's blowing, it's blowing the bait around. The fish are going to be feeding, are going to be most active where the most food is and the water is a little bit churned up, which is a good thing. But if I'm in there, I'm looking for birds. If I, don't, if I see some birds diving or some feet, some, some action over here, I'm not going to not go there because it's when the wind protected side, I'm still going to go check it out and, and try, but the, putting the odds on our favors is, is the goal here with, with setting the plan. You always put the odds in your favor, your plan. And then when you're going from spot to spot, that's when you're on the lookout for other things. So I would really just be picking up all these points. Because the, the the wind the points have been have been a ticket lately. Again, for those insiders, you know we've been talking about this cons, um, consistently for a while. Points have been huge. So all these different points I would check out, and then the points that are best I would I would keep fishing up the shoreline. And if the points are bust, odds are the rest of the shoreline's a bust. Again, unless there's some pockets of bait somewhere or something unique, that's uh, that's worth checking out. So where I would not fish, um, number one is I would definitely not fish anywhere around here in the middle of the bay oh why do you hate roberts so much you were i don't i don't, yeah, I don't hate roberts I, I just i just hate not, i hate areas with no structure at all so i see so many people and we used to do it too so i'm not i'm not, I'm not uh, uh making fun of anybody or being kind of sinning we all we all do this at some point we just go out i see a bird dive out here in the middle of the bay which is normal right a lot of like a lot of bait fish are kind of scattered around 
So a bird would dive and oh man, like we'd see that and get pumped up. Now it's great, there's, there's food here, let's fish. So we go up there, we drop anchor and there's like, it's, it's just flat, flat bottom, no structure. And that bait fish, it was probably a bait fish school going from one good spot to another good spot. And you just happen to catch them in between. And you just sit there forever waiting on the fish to bite, sit there for two hours and then, okay, maybe we should leave. You know, where in reality, okay, we just, it just wasn't a very smart spot. It didn't have any structure. You know, if we're targeting snook, redfish, sea trout, flounder, they're all structure oriented fish. The odds of them holding in an area with just straight flat sand or mud and nothing else is very slim. So it's not worth even trying it. Although so, it could be, a, uh, I, Roberts Bay could be a great place to pick off a couple of catfish. Yeah, probably, probably, uh, probably a good catfish bite out there, right? And, uh, but again, if there is some structure down there, then it totally changes, right? So in, in this case, it, from this map, you can't see any structure. This is likely too deep to actually see it. But again, just to put the odds in the favor, I would be searching for areas with docks, with any, really anything other than flat sand. It's basically what we teach, anything other than flat sand, or flat mud could be something that an ambush predator can use to hide and catch bait or to hide from its predators like dolphin and sharks. So yeah, where I would not fish is just the middle of the bays um, where there's nothing happening. And I, I wouldn't fish, um, let's see, really all the, sh any shoreline has a pretty good amount of potential. Um, but I, I just wouldn't fish areas that just didn't have much like these docks don't really have anything fancy, anything other than just docks in the seawall. Again, sometimes it's good, but I prefer areas that have like this, where it's a dock plus some grass out there. Oh yeah. Um, depth changes. Just again, the more structure, the better. As we, you know, we teach, if you maximize your structure, you're gonna maximize your results. It's just, it's really all about putting the odds in your favor. That's awesome. Hey, let's go back to smart fishing tides real quick, unless you got anything else here. Because um, we didn't go down to the hourly projections and the sonar too. I, I've seen quite a few people have been posting about that, you know, depending on even, even here in Venice, I mean, which should be, you know, a clear area in terms of, of looking at clear water on a map. The sonar reveals a lot. It's pretty cool. But let's go down to the hourly feeding level production. So if you're listening to this, we're still on, or now we're on smartfishingtides.com. We were on the area where it shows the actual tide chart along with the wind direction and the temperature and rain, et cetera. And now right below it, we have it broken down by hourly feeding level projections, which is based on a proprietary formula that, uh, that we created really just for inshore saltwater anglers. This is not going to work offshore. This is not going to work if you're trying to catch uh, bass. Uh, this, is, this is for inshore saltwater fishing. Yeah, for snook, redfish, heat drop on And and so, and it's all, it's all lined up. So as we saw before, I said, in the, is if, once you're good at map reading and you, and you know what the trends are, it should take you about a minute to realize when the best bite's gonna be, right? And if you, even if you don't wanna learn, bother learning that stuff, <laughs> you can just look at the hourly feeding projections, which is right below it, and you see the same conclusion. I it's, almost like, it's almost like you created the formula for it. <laughs> yeah, and, and so in, in the morning, right? that's going to be the best bite because of what I mentioned before. It's factoring in, it's factoring all the stuff that's, that's important. It's factoring in the, the season, the wind speed, the, the wind direction, um, the time of day, obviously, the weather, uh, the barometric pressure, it's, it's, it's factoring all that for you so that you don't have to, you don't have to do anything. Yep. And this could look completely, and it would look completely different like 60 days from now. A lot of that would switch. I mean, I remember, you know, in the wintertime, a, a lot of the, those green bars, if, if you're listening, the, the bright green bars basically say this is your best chance of the day to catch an inshore slam. They were towards the middle of the day or, you know, 11, 11 to 12 in the, in the morning. Uh, so it's, uh, it's cool to, to watch this thing shift. So now you're on the local radar. Yes, yeah, so we also me. have a radar. This is crucial. So all fishermen, uh, I think this is, it's very, very important to know what, what direction the clouds are going in, because that doesn't always match the, the, the wind speed, you know, the ground, the ground wind direction. In many cases, it doesn't. Um, in this case, it's not, right? So we know the wind's coming from the southeast, but it's, the clouds are moving southwest. So super important. So I, I look at the radar motion every single trip, so that I know if I see a cloud on the horizon, should I be worried or should I not be worried, right? 
But if I, if I know the exact path of that cloud, I can then know if it's going to hit me or not, or at least have a pretty good idea. So very, very important is to use that, that radar motion. Uh, we have the satellite map. I, I should have been using this map. So this map has everything that we just talked about, um, where you can literally do your entire plan straight from this. Um, so in this, in this, it's Google Maps is, is what the API is. This is a normal Google map. This is the easiest one to use. You can, you can have this little person here, right? You can check to see the, the different areas. Oh, look at that. You can even do the, the on the water stuff in here. Check wait, that out. Wait a minute. So if we want to see what, yeah. what on the water. We can put this little yellow guy on the path on the water and see exactly what's going on. That is, so we can actually look at our spot before we get there. Look, like you this. can see, you can see the boat they're on. Yeah. Try to scroll down and see if you can see more of the boat. I want to see let the you? spot first. I want to, it probably will. I'm going to check out. So, so one of the spots I mentioned was this shoreline. That is remarkable. You can literally go and check out the shore. I'm sure this isn't for everybody. Uh, so it's on a T it's on top of a T top. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Look at it. You see the shadow of it. That's crazy. He's going idle speed. Good, good, good guy. Um, yeah, pretty remarkable. So again, how valuable is this, right? No longer do you have to go out and spend, uh, if you go on a weekend trip somewhere new, spend like the first day scouting to like try to find something good, you know, just go there and uh, or just get on these maps and you can literally see what's happening right there. This is, again, the amount of information that's available to us now is, is remarkable. And it's just more matter. like, I don't think th that was there and it could have been in this spot a, a month ago, but it's like every week Google has got more boats, mopeds, helicopters, and cars out there, like documenting everything and updating obviously the, the images. And if you guys are listening, all Duke did, he's on smartfishingtides.com. He grabbed that little, uh, I guess it's a man icon. It's like a yellow or orangish icon and dropped it. And as soon as you start kind of hovering it above the map, you can see all the places that you're allowed to, to put it down. And I mean, we're literally like on a boat view looking at these spots. Uh, I mean, this, like this changes everything. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So now that first spot I mentioned, we can literally zoom in. It looks like some rock, little rocky shoreline there, which is excellent. And that's something that I would not have been able to, oh, look at it. Yeah, we can even zoom right in here. So we can get another zoom in again. This is like, literally is phenomenal where it's still in that smart fishing tides and we can see a nice clear view of this rocky wall with the depth change this is a spot that i will be shocked if there's not a decent amount of fish here um, so this would be my first spot if, I'm, if i was going tomorrow i'd be going right to this point it has it's the it has a good spot but it's not just the spot as we talked about it has the right conditions for that spot there's no spot that is always good, no matter what the conditions are. And uh, those fish move, right? Those fish aren't comfortable. They're not just going to sit there and take it on the chin. They're going to, they're going to move and go somewhere that's more comfortable or that has more food. Um, so again, super, super important to get away from the spot mentality. It's all about the type of spot based on the conditions mentality. That was like the, biggest change I ever had in my fishing game is once I got away from spots and I totally, I don't care about a spot. I, I care about the type of spot based on the conditions. Yeah. So like if I hear somebody catch a fish, the last thing I care about is where they were. I want to know like what type of spot were you fishing and like what the conditions were, because then I can replicate that a thousand times. Whereas if you go on a spot, remember Joe, we'd have our, our five or six spots and somebody be in one of them and that wrecked our whole day because like that was a huge percentage of our spots. <laughs> and, yeah. and when you talk, when you, when you put the focus on type of spot based conditions, somebody's in, in the number one spot, no problem, right? Let's go to the next one. Again, go to the next type of spot that fits that same, that same, uh, um, you know, uh, data set. And let's, let's keep going on a sonar and that, why Luke's doing that, the, what he's explaining here is the, really the whole, the whole mission of this insider club is to get you not dependent on spots. You know, the whole saying, give a, give a man a fishing spot and you maybe get him tight lines for a day. If you teach him how to find his or her own spots based on trends, based on looking at this, based on doing a pre-trip plan, they, you know, you've helped them feed themselves and get tight lines for forever, for years, hopefully generations. If you pass it on to your kids, it's game changing. And I see it all the time 
from, you know, people who are frustrated is, is they're all about the spot. Just like, man, if I only had a couple of GPS spots in my area, it would change everything. Absolutely wrong. I, it might change everything for a trip, but if you really want to change everything long-term, like consistency, you need to know how to read maps. You need to know how to find spots based on the trends, based on science, based on weather. And that is what we do in the Insider Club. We, we, we take you by the hand. We don't make you just figure it out. We obviously want you to earn some of it. We give you the foundation for it, but we're, we're doing this every single week, uh, usually in 10 minutes or less. We try to respect everyone's time and as a, as a member, because I know a lot of times that, you know, you, you waited the last second because uh, we're all kind of procrastinators and, and you want something quick. And so we try to do it every Friday, 10 minutes or less, get on a map. And, and based on all the stuff we're seeing that week in the community and based on weather and, and based on all the, the real time on the water reports, we can literally say, here's the kind of spots that you want to be fishing this week. And so what's crazy in 60 days from now, 60 days from right now, everything that we just did, including the spots we picked out will be completely different night and day different because a lot of you might be saying well man this i'm in venice this just solved all my problems wrong like it only solves your problems if you take this next to the next level and figure out how to find those spots based on the trends because like in winter time for instance we would have been going much farther up right we would have been finding wind protected areas versus what we just did here and so in 60 days from now and even less this entire pre-trip plan looks absolutely different and I think that part's so critical that, that a lot of weekend warriors aren't, aren't grasping yet. And that's probably why you might, might be frustrated is, is you just stuck to those handful of spots because someone did a, a cool spot dissection like this for you. Uh, no, I'm just telling you, if you get in the club, if you, if you already remember, you know this, if you're not, join us in there. You're going to see your game skyrocket because we're just doing this stuff over and over and over again to the point it just becomes second nature like it is for Luke. Yeah, and and, uh, and so the sonar again. If we if we're in an area, that in, in many cases, especially for those of us who are targeting shallower water, we can we can get a pretty good grasp of what the depths are just by these satellite maps. But there's a lot of areas where that's just not the case. And so then we just go down, scroll down just a hair, click sonar map, and now you have a, you know an actual depth chart of the area, so that you can see what's going on. Super super valuable. And again, if we look at that that first spot, um, and it's actually overlaid with the so you can see the land that's satellite and then the the actual water has these lines and obviously the lines represent the depths. So you can see here's a, a 10 foot hole or sorry, 10 foot peak and then it gets down to 14 feet and then it'll steadily go up from 14 feet to shoreline in this small time frame. So a big shelf, that's a really good sign. Big shelf up to a shoreline with good structure is a really, really good spot to, uh, to seek out. So that's the cool thing about this map. You can just, you can really, you know, see the bottom even in areas that don't have clear water or the deep parts of areas if you're really focused on deep air. So back to Roberts Bay, as we mentioned, again, the spot that I would not fish, right? Look at this whole bay. You have, it's about four feet deep pretty much everywhere. And it ranges from four feet to three feet. And then one little peak of two feet, all in a huge bay. That's the last, that's, that's where we do not want to be fishing. So it's just flat bottom, um, there, there's not going to be many, many structure oriented fish in there, right? So like our, our favorite fish, snook redfish, sea trout flounder are most likely not going to be there. They're going to be pushed up along these shorelines because that's where the structure is. Um, so super, super important. Cool. That's awesome. And then next thing, you're not going to see it on here. Uh, it's only in the community for our insiders is uh, strike spots. So we've taken now all this data from from ourselves because you know we now have four and a half years of of all data of all these fishing spots that that we're going to personally uh that's you know myself and luke and tony and white our fishing coaches and then with all the members and we're able to to basically overlay a map and show you the regions that have been best based on the day i mean it, it's like next level uh, you know, using artificial intelligence to kind of predict where you should be fishing. So you take everything we just showed you 
and then that it's it's almost like you, you showed earlier luke with the uh, the hourly um uh peak or feeding time it's almost like a check to hey make sure like here are the areas i picked out let me let me go check to see what's what's happened historically to see if that looks about right and then if it does like all right boom let's do this people have been catching a lot of fish in this area during this time frame this looks uh this looks money so that's called strike spots for you insider members you should see that in your uh, your account if you're not an insider member <laughs> oh boy you're missing out my friend come join us today oh gone strike spots yeah. that yeah, thing's so awesome that, that uh the strike spots that's really for the beginners to intermediate i would say it's it's like joe said it's like a it's like a checkpoint and and so it's a good way to validate your your assumptions and for for advanced people really for all levels we have the community platform which is it's really like a facebook group on steroids which is uh so all the members are posted in there it's just as easy to post just like facebook but it's all sortable and, and regionalized based on you know, based on cities, based on bodies of water, and so that you can actually interact with other members fishing near you to get the, the real-time human intelligence on, hey, uh, are, are the tarpon coming through? Just just like some, you can see some unique things that are happening. That's what I, I look at that every single trip before I go, just to see if there's something unique that's happening that's out of the norm. Um, and I got onto some good tarpon uh, again last this time last, last year, and just because a member posted saying he saw some tarpon, I brought the fly rod out, which I, I hadn't used in like a year, and I went on and caught a tarp just because of that one little tip in there. So just a wealth of information in there. And so highly recommend for, for all members um, to, to make sure to be checking out the community. There's like, there's like, I think it's like 50 reports a day going up now, plus or minus. Crazy. So a ton of information. And as I said before, it's all, it's all sorted by, by geographic location. You can sort by species, all that fun stuff. Yep. So guys, hopefully uh, that was helpful. This uh, kind of ultimate blueprint for pre-trip planning for inshore saltwater species. Uh, as we've said numerous times in here, we've, uh, we've, we've created the tools for you. We've got an entire platform, entire community to help support you. We got fishing coaches and full-time guides to help support you. And it's all in the Insider Club. It's, it's why we exist is to help you maximize your time to, to help you go out there and catch more fish per trip. And of course now save a lot of money on uh, all your tackle. Uh, we, we had a, a one coming today you saw that email, Luke, I won't say the, the brand, but it's a, it's a very big nationally known brand who uh, asked to sponsor us today. And, uh, and we quickly said no to them and just told them like, we don't take sponsors. We want to continue to have this club be completely unbiased so that we can go out there and, and test all their products and tell you exactly what works, what doesn't work, what's the best value, what's not the best value, and then give the best value products to you at 20% off or more. So usually 20 to 30% off uh, everything in our store for insider members. So we got people that save, I mean, three, $400 a year uh, just on the, on the tackle, including myself. So I uh, hope you'll join us there. You can go learn more at saltstrong.com. You'll see a little button that says join the insider club. Few current insider members, doggone, we appreciate you. Uh, I mean, really, we talk about it all the time internally, just how fortunate we are, how, how lucky we are, how blessed we are to have amazing members, amazing, uh, you know, we, we call clients, family member, whatever you want to say. Uh, it, I mean, it is it is so cool to see people that share the same love that we do for fishing that that really want to get the next generation out fishing that uh, that, that believe in, in conservation and, and doing the right thing. And, uh, and being positive and helpful, just no cursing, no belittling, just people sharing anglers, anglers helping anglers. It's, uh, it's been really neat to have a look. Absolutely. Yeah, this has been, this has been awesome. As you said, it, it's just really, it's really awesome to be able to be, you know, 100%, um, you know, I guess in, in allegiance with members where we, we're not relying on sponsors. So we're not having to, to sell any sort of brands that, you know, that because they're paying us money, this is all just organic, you know, uh, all the product reviews that we can do now are, are just totally unbiased. And, uh, and this has been awesome. So uh, we really appreciate your support and enabling us to, to have that sort of that sort of business model, which I think is very much needed. I can't tell you how much money I've wasted on tackle that was recommended either in books, magazines or TV shows. And now I realize that it actually wasn't the best. It was just something that a company was paying yeah, it was just for a paid, ad. paid ad promotion yeah. sponsorship nothing wrong with that i get it it's part of every business probably every industry but we don't want no part of it we want to tell you what uh, what works and, and help you save time and money so we appreciate you guys come join us in the club if you haven't already 
And uh, let us know what you thought about this. I, I know some of you might be watching this on YouTube, some listening on the, the podcast. Uh, let us know. We'd love to hear from you in the, in the comment section down below. Uh, certainly YouTube. We try to check all these comments, but definitely on our blog page. We put every podcast on the blog page, which is just saltstore.com in the fishing tip section. And we, we literally do read and respond to every comment. Sometimes it takes us a while because we get so many, but that's where we're dedicated every morning looking at that stuff. So guys, thank you. I learned something here on the, we got to do a whole nother podcast on this, you know, this whole new uh, Google maps for boats, this, uh, the waterways and Pretty stuff. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I've seen it. It's, it's starting to pop up. I've seen it in a few, in a few areas. So it's relatively new. It's not everywhere, but it's, uh, it's going it to be, be. Yep. Pretty amazing. Yep. All right, guys, that's it. We out of here. Peace. See you, Luke.